And this is just to give you some context for this talk. This talk is about, uh, it's one chapter in a book that's on artificial intelligence, robotics, and law and policy. And the bottom line of this book is that, unfortunately, too much of AI, robotics, and tech law and policy have been dominated by an economistic and engineering mindset. That is, I find often too methodologically and uh, individualistic. And I should say it's just one narrow portion of economics that sort of dominates it, rather than, you know, I think the full breadth of economics that is out there. And so what I'm trying to do with this project overall is to bring in other methodologies to forms of artificial intelligence and robotics in various fields. One of the problems that I've had is that in much of the book, it, is a, it can follow a relatively straightforward narrative, which is I focused on how to bring in technology to complement rather than replace existing human labor in order to improve people's productive capacity, their value as laborers, etc. With law, with war, and with a few other areas, it is not nearly as simple. And it's very difficult to sort of figure out because you can't really just go into the story of automation, artificial intelligence, and war and think of your summum bonum, your highest goal, as how do we create technology that can kill as many people as possible, as rapidly as possible, right? That, that can't be the summum bonum. So what, what is it? And that's what I'm trying to explore today. From the lens of political economy, a little bit of uh, international relations theory, but certainly not a huge amount. You know, there's just a, something, that you, just a glance at what that field is looking at here, and how a political economy approach may change the dialogue about killer robots, which I think has become a bit stereotyped. Okay, so let's start. I'm going to start with an example of lethal autonomous weapon systems as a form of evolution of technology. And this is from the book The Master Algorithm by Pedro Domingos. He's a Wash University of Washington computer science uh, pro uh, professor. And he has written, I think, one of the best popular accounts of how I'm just going to close this up. Oh, sorry. Uh, the, uh, of, of how machine learning AI, some other uh, technologies will develop over time. I'm going to do a slide on exactly how that might work. Oh, fine. That's okay. I'll get that. And um, one of the things that he raised in his book was this um, idea that he hypothesized to some of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency in uh, the US, where he said, Why, if we really wanted to get serious about having the most effective killing machines in war, why wouldn't we create an island or some sort of uh, factory that's really isolated from people and just Darwinianly have machines try to slaughter each other? And then once the machines had, you know, once we've evolved, we could have the fantasy would be to have the one thing that was left standing would be our weapon, right? And there are, there are versions of this actually on a TV show, I think, called Robot Wars or Robot Fights. Or, has anyone seen this show? I don't know. <laughs> you know and so this was the, and, and he said, why, why wouldn't we do this? And, you know, this is actually, it's, there's a Russian story called Crabs on the Island, which he actually imagines this quite evocatively in 1960. Um, but, you know, he brought it up just, I think he independently thought of it. And rather than the, the folks at DARPA saying, this is a completely crazy, mad idea, and we're terrified. They said, oh yeah, that's feasible. You know, maybe we should do something like that. Of course, something like this would all be done in simulation now, right? And one of the ideas that I, I love getting across in this work is from William Bogart's simulation and surveillance, which is that you know, the ability to simulate and to think out all possible scenarios is quite a powerful one. And one that AI researchers claim to have modeled very well in the game of Go. You might have noticed the success of AlphaGo and uh, Google's ability to create a machine learning program that could essentially beat anyone at Go, even the best players in the world, just iteratively based on uh, it playing itself. Okay, imagine if you just start playing chess against yourself and you gradually became better and better at that. Um, this machine could learn, I believe within three days, how to master the game of Go, which computer programs have not been able to master for over um, 50, 60 years of having relevant technology to that. So that's the, the thought process, right? And this is one form, one of the five main forms of machine learning is evolutionary algorithms, right? That would be used in something like this robot factory, uh, robot, uh, Darwinian robot world all against all. Now, I certainly cannot explain all of this myself 
even given in many days, but uh, certainly not in the talking comments of a talk. But what this gives you a sense of is that what I just talked about with respect to the last example of his evolution, that's just one of the five main schools of machine learning, right? We have connectionists, symbolists, symbolists, analogizers, Bayesians, etc. And you know, these are all working off of metaphors for, say, success uh, or failure in nature, that's like a revolution. With the Bayesians, they're working off of um, something can try something and either they get a reward or not, and it's very complex statistics. But again, this can be run through uh, various machine learning programs, AI programs, connections, etc. This is all stuff that what um, Pedro Domingo has described in his book, Master Algorithm. One other thing, and it's probably the last time I'll mention this book, but it's a really important book, this Master Algorithm book, because it actually appeared last year on the bookshelf of Xi Jinping with uh, Mao and Marx. It had Mao and Marx and the Master Algorithm. And you can connect all of that into the Chinese social credit scoring system, which essentially is an algorithmic effort to rank and rate individuals that I'm working on another project uh, with, with researchers in Taipei on. But the bottom line of this is that this sort of way of knowing the world, there's tons of investment in it, and it's going to really affect how, we, uh, how defense works in the future. So that's sort of the computer science and technology sort of side of things. We'll come back to a bit of it. But here's a map of the dominant left debate on lethal autonomous weapon systems or laws. There are realists who say, this is the future of warfare. There's going to be an arms race. Get on top of it. I think Vladimir Putin once was quoted saying, the person, the country that rules an AI will rule the world. Right? You can imagine that from the robots on the island context. If somehow China, Russia, name your pick, develops the robot that can just subjugate all other things, game over. That's it. So your goal should be, if you really believe in this realistic perspective, to invest a ton in this stuff, or to create collective security agreement, uh, arrangements that would uh, effectively try to marshal the power of someone that did uh, do that type of investment. The second group is the reform, well, I should actually start with the third group, and put, put in the third as the reformers as the, as the happy medium. The third group says ban killer robots. They say, if you think about the first example I gave, if you think, for example, about, um, there's a recent uh, YouTube video called Swarm Bots, where they show, they imagine very vividly what it would be like if terrorists got a hold of tons of swarm bots that were just tiny, almost insect-sized drones that could deliver a lethal playload and just uh, got those into various airspaces and attacked how horrific that would be. Um, the evolution should just say you've got to ban this. Okay? It's going to get out of control so easily. The reformers say, no, we've got to actually by national and international law, or by code, by computer code, actually regulate these things. And there are folks like Bill Arkin at the University of Georgia that try to code into either autonomous or semi-autonomous weapons code that says things like at coordinate 90 latitude, 89 longitude, there is a pharmacy plant. You cannot hit the pharmacy plant. The bomb cannot go off there, or something like that. Right? So they, they, they hope for something on code. Now, that, that to me strikes me as the most wildly idealistic of all of these. But, but um, they're all, all of these folks are sort of debating one another as we speak. And I want to run through the strengths and weaknesses of each approach. Here's the positive case for the autonomous weapon systems. Okay? So the positive case is that this uh, Michael Schmidt from the Stockton Center at the Naval War College says, this is what we need to make sure that emotional, angry, biased human beings don't take out their anger and their misplaced judgments on the people they're at war against. Okay? And this is a common theme in the history of algorithmic regulation, it's something that I get into in my book, Black Box Society, where I talk about credit scoring. And the main reason why we started using scores as opposed to personal judgments and credit, or one reason why, was the thought that individuals deciding whether to give credit or not would be biased. They could, they could have racial, gender, other forms of bias. And that we would use a computer and have scores that would be a fairer assessment, right? So that would be one version of this. And a version also here is that he would say, given the advances in facial gate recognition, a killer robot might shoot only the men 21 to 65 in the village, right? 
And this can be drilled down to extreme precision. So in the type of literature that Gregoire Chamiou uh, describes in his uh, book Drone Theory, he reviews a lot of the, the, uh, the international uh, uh, human rights justifications for these weapons. And it says that, you know, don't forget about going for men between 21 and 65. We could just go after the people who have been adjudged to be dangerous. Okay? And there are now technology companies that offer these types of scores for people. So IBM has offered to the European uh, Commission uh, and, and to countries within Europe a scoring system that for anyone who comes over and uh, says, a migrant who says that they are a refugee, the IBM scoring system would give a score as the percentage likelihood of it, the person being a likely refugee or being a terrorist. Right? So I, for one, don't trust this technology. Like, I don't trust that you could actually do that very well, uh, at least in the way it's framed now. And I've critiqued it a lot, but I want to put it out there as the main rationale for why we want these things and why some people actually say that their technological development is morally required. They don't just defend the killer robot, they say it is incumbent upon us to have incredibly precise, algorithmically data-driven killer robots. Now, in thinking about that, I like to think about, you know, there are a, there's a spectrum of conflict. And we can think about a range from total unrestricted warfare to partial warfare to law enforcement, right? And one of the things the uh, historian and legal scholar Sam Moyne has pointed out a lot recently is that war has become more common and more, uh, in so many theaters, it's become more common, lasting longer, but it's a gentler war. It's like a kinder, gentler war, right? <laughs> kinder, gentler war in the sense that you can you almost think of the war as a version, the aspiration is to law enforcement, right? Where they're just looking for the bad guys. That's the theory of many of these occupations and the occupations that are going on. Again, I'm skeptical of this because I feel like it's just, there's no forms of due process behind it, right? And as Marianne O'Connor, or I had to go to pointed out, you can't classify your occupation as a form of law enforcement or something like that. Uh, if you're not giving forms of due process, other things traditionally associated with criminal law, right? Now, oops, sorry, coming back though to the total unrestricted warfare uh, idea. One of the things that also comes out in the literature is that uh, in the book Drone Theory, uh, point to tries to analogize total domination of an area to hunting and not warfare. And you might see that there's a great deal of moral outrage when people see, for example, uh, someone goes to a park, a safari park, and it's a guy in a helicopter coming down and shooting a rhinoceros or something, right? That just strikes people as this is not really, this is like a hunt, right? Or this is not even fair hunting. And he pointed the difference between the moral outrage in America over someone created a website that would allow you to click on a mouse and pull a trigger to kill a deer that was remote versus the lack of moral outrage over drone warfare that seemed to him as unequal to fight, right? Now, other folks like the Marriott, like George Mary Friedman, like uh, Schmidt that I just showed, they say there's no such thing as a fair fight in warfare. No one wants a fair fight. It's not a good thing. So technological supremacy is the future of war, and we shouldn't be worried about these fair fight types of concerns. Okay. Now, I think often these laws positions are embedded in other debates, right? And that's what I want to sort of start uncovering and excavating, because I think in a lot of the literature, um, the realists and others, they don't acknowledge the degree to which they're embedded in some other debates. First, I think a lot of the realists, like Schmidt, are embedded in a framework of a Pax Americana. There's an assumption, you know, and again, certainly in the international audience, this, uh, I don't need to belabor a criticism of it, but so there's this assumption among a lot of the war, college, military doctrine that uh, America, the United States, is seen as this benevolent force that is out there that is trying to keep the peace. And you know, that sort of is the idea there. There's, sometimes there's a bipolarism right, of US and China. The thought is that the US and China will sort of be taking, having spheres of influence being the most important entities. They're leading in military power. They're leading AI, artificial intelligence, robotics power. Um, and then finally, there's a multipolarism, the sense that there's going to be lots of force distributed around the world, that there be, we're over the sort of bipolar distinction, we're over the sort of idea that any one country could have hegemony over the world, that it's going to be multipolar. Okay? 
All of those, I think, this literature has to be much clearer about what it's assuming in terms of its either apprehension of the current state of global affairs or its aspiration for the future of global affairs. So I think that's one thing that needs to be added to the global robots debates. The second is AI is existential risk versus a more pragmatic reform movement. Within the people that are writing about accountability and ethics and artificial intelligence, some are obsessed with the idea of a general artificial intelligence gaining more and more knowledge so eventually it's smarter than humans and then takes over the world, right? Or in Nick Bostrom's idea is that it could be so smart that it could just be programmed to do a relatively innocuous thing like make paper clips, but then it might not be programmed to recognize that human beings are something that you wouldn't try to make paper clips out of, right? It's like the matrix approach, right? You know, that's one approach. There are others, though, the more common view among AI reform, AI ethics, law, and policy, and there's, there's a person who leads, one of the leaders there is Kate Crawford, who will be giving a talk to the Royal Society in a few days, I think. Her idea, and the idea of AI now, um, uh, data justice, uh, data for black lives, a lot of other groups that are uh, working on data ethics and AI ethics, is that that concern about general AI is a distraction from the current reality of systematic biases and data gaps in the AI and robotics that we have. And if we don't correct those, we'll never get ahead of the AI as existential risk problem. Okay. That debate goes on. And frankly, the people that want to ban killer robots are often talking about the existential risk, but they also talk about the pragmatic side. Um, but the, the, they're, they gain attention via the attention to existential risk, and that's kind of distorted the debate, debate a bit. A third part of the debate is the proper level of social resources to devote to guard labor. Okay, this is a term from uh, Bowles and Ardaya, their great article, Guard Labor, where they estimate that uh, roughly 20% of the US GDP goes on things like police, military, lawyers, um, other uh, security guards, basically efforts to guard wealth and keep the existing distribution of resources either the same or roughly similar so that things are only distributed, so that, uh, to, to keep that, that existing distribution of resources. So that's sort of a, a complaint is by some folks who say, you could, from a realist perspective, say you've got to invest as much as possible, but are you really thinking about what's the proper level of social resources before we become a garrison state, you know, or just like over, totally over invest in these things, right? So what I want to do is try to clarify the stakes of these debates. And I move to interpretive social science, okay? And what I try to, what I'm going to try to evolve or excavate in this talk and to clarify is, why do these uh, positions make sense to different people? I'm not going to try to push a certain position myself because I think um, it's, uh, I want to hold in advance that type of advocacy for now. But what I want to do is to try to figure out why does a realist or a reform or an abolitionist perspective make sense to different people. And in that, I'm inspired by Charles Taylor's philosophical papers where he talks about how we interpret things and particularly how rival narratives about phenomena can lead to different policy positions. Okay. So that's, that's what I'm going to try to look at in these next slides. The abolitionists are inspired by international bans on biological weapons and blinding lasers. So their idea is generally one of a meliorist idea of human progress where perhaps hundreds of years ago you could imagine total war where the idea was you would kill and try to scare and maim and torture your opponent as quickly as possible and as mercilessly as possible but that as part of the advance of humanity over time, that we shy away from this sort of absolute devotion to expending as much resources as possible to intimidate and to dehumanize the opponent, okay? So that's, I think, and they believe in a multilateral process that the UN's defined and ban killer robots because of that. I really want to buy into that idea of human progress, right? And also, just to go back to another element of Taylor, Charles Taylor talks about our epistemic gains over time. <clears throat> that we know certain things, and we have certain moral commitments um, that wouldn't necessarily have existed in the Middle Ages or before that. Steven Pinker has really pushed that argument, I think, too far in his book Enlightenment Now, where he, uh, and, and uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, where he says, you know, things are better than ever and getting better, you know. Um, but I'd like to think there's some level of common human commitments to avoid scenarios like 
this is like a still from the very scary film about swarm bots, you know, scenarios where uh, warring parties, war terrorist groups simply deploy in um, uh, buildings, other spaces, swarm bots to kill people, right? That is the, that's the hope. Okay. The problems for the abolitionists are that it seems like a abolition is both under-inclusive and over-inclusive as an arms control approach. Under-inclusive in the sense that a nuclear threat is far more severe than what we've seen in killer robots so far. Right? So it would seem that if you're committed to abolition of the killer robots, you probably also have to be committed to abolition of nuclear weapons, which is you know, harder. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a difficult stance. But I think it's, it, it sort of, it just suggests that maybe they have to, and maybe the answer there is that they have to broaden what they're doing, right? That rather than just focusing on killer robots, they've got to have a broader, perhaps over time, perhaps over types of weapons, approach to de-escalating either conflict or potential for incredibly damaging conflict. The other side of this is going back to Schmidt's argument from the very beginning of the talk, that some forms of autonomous weaponry seem necessary. So for example, defensive cyber warfare, right? If we were to think about all of the vulnerabilities to cyber warfare that different states have, perhaps you need to automate your method of monitoring and responding to cyber warfare threats. Now, I think these folks with bad killer robots would say, well, we're not talking about that. We're talking about kinetic killer robots. OK, that's fine. But even other defensive capabilities, they might seem necessary for uh, in terms of, and that's the, the biggest problem in a lot of these arms control talks, is many times your defensive capabilities are so easily transferred or shifted to offensive capabilities. So that's yet another problem here. Um, uh, there's a scholar, Rebecca Krutoff, um, a, a colleague of mine at the Yale ISP, uh, who says that they're already here, so there's no way to ban them categorically. Okay? She points to various types of sentries on the Korean border. So in South Korea, I think, has these robotic sentries that will kill on sight anyone that goes beyond a certain path point. Um, there are other versions of them uh, in terms of drones that are becoming like, more and more autonomous. So that's, that's sort of okay. Um, the regulatory approaches, and here I, I draw on Krutoff, and just for a little bit of visual interest, this is called the Octo Roach. This is an autonomous weapon that tries to uh, mimic the uh, survivability thanks, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, mobility of a roach. Uh, and one of the other things that I think is quite frightening about this whole uh, field is that there's a whole field of biomimicry in robotics where you think of any sort of particularly uh, terrifying animal, there are probably people that are trying to uh, uh, take some of its capabilities and convert them into robotic capabilities. So that process is happening now. And you know, looking at that, you know, trying to make sure that doesn't get out of control, what someone like Krutoff says is that a treaty might attempt comprehensive regulation like the Chemical Weapons Convention to ban all these types of chemical weapons and have other enforcement mechanisms that would, uh, that would be involve piecemeal regulation, piecemeal monitoring, and then having a framework convention for the way in which parties to the convention would define what's acceptable and what's not. So that's the goal behind something like the, this, uh, this uh, treaty-based approach. Moving a little bit further, this could lead to a rapprochement between the abolitionists and the reformers, which is the core insight of the reformers is to, is to say that we have to find certain types of autonomous weaponry that are behind, beyond the pale, right? That we just would not develop. And then we can put them into the ban international human rights norms, the type of treaty that would lead to regulation of the development of the technology, right? That's, that's an approach, right? Um, now, this I would call the normal science of arms control, you know, just based on the Kuhn cycle and the structure of scientific revolutions. I'd say that this effort at a rapprochement between the abolitionists and the reformers is, is something like this normal science, where we're trying, we're working within a certain paradigm of how do we ban prior weapons and how do we use that history to ban future weapons. But there are some philosophical dilemmas here that I think we need to think a little bit more about, which is that is human responsibility the key? What if algorithmic approaches are more targeted? But could that even be proven given the small end problem, given that there's only a small number of times we've ever, we ever have seen or will see the deployment of these types of algorithmic approaches? So these types of questions, I think, really call into question, because I think we could all agree that something like 
um, a smallpox virus genetically engineered to be transmissible via a coffin or something would be airborne transmissible, that that would be something no one wants, right? Absolutely no one wants that. With respect to an algorithm that could deliver a lethal blow of a poison to anyone based on facial recognition, it may be that some people want that because they feel like that's the way to target a killing as opposed to killing everyone that's in the house with the person that you want to kill. Okay. And this is what I hope we can discuss in the Q&A and, and elsewhere is, do you think that that type of facial recognition algorithmic targeting could be classified as something closer to the engineering of an airborne transmissible biological weapon? Or is it something closer to better targeting of bombs? And it's kind of remarkable to think about you know, how much better targeted bombs have become since 1945. I and mean, it's just like uh, smart bombs were even being talked about in the 1990s, but now there's like this incredibly even more precision targeting. And uh, I think you know, the debate could go either way. But I, and I think because that debate could go either, either way, it, the core insight of abolitionists is that meaningful human control by legitimate governing authorities may be a precondition for ending conflict. Okay? So if you were to unleash certain types of weapons that were autonomous, maybe the only way that you can end that conflict is having meaningful human control over them. I don't know, something we could recall. Them. We'll, we'll come back to this. Another thing, though, that I want us to think about is what could disrupt the rapprochement that I'm suggesting, right? What could disrupt the type of, the way that uh, we frame this idea of international cooperation? And I think one thing that could disrupt it is a realist narrative that you can trust no one. Okay? If you have the idea that international cooperation can't work, certainly some of the ideas behind Brexit, right? I mean, maybe one core, I mean, I know there's lots to the Brexit story, but maybe one idea of breaking apart is you can't trust this large international grouping, right? You can't trust people on the international scale. So the point of Trumpism is to emphasize that we're all in it on our own, etc. okay? I think of that as something that DARPA has commissioned at Arizona State University as a weaponized narrative. I think there are ways in which you can weaponize your narratives of the nature of humanity and the nature of human care cooperation such that people that want to see vast military buildups and that want to see sort of a, um, a, a Hobbesian environment could weaponize those narratives, and there's another book on strategic narratives here, um, uh, Alistair McKinnon has done a lot of interesting work on this. All of these ways can be ways of weaponizing the narrative to disrupt the type of consensus and trust necessary for <coughs> the rapprochement between abolitionists and regulators that I talked about earlier. And I think that's something that they really have to think deeply about. They have to think very deeply about how do you maintain international trust in a time in which of such disruptive politics and where hatred of the other has become such a powerful mode of political campaigning and ways of obtaining power. Okay. Another threat is a self-reinforcing realist perspective. So I have up here the National Security Strategy of the US, which this is from 2006, but you know, for some time, has basically just said, the US needs to be the most powerful power in the world. We're not even thinking about allowing any sort of, uh, we, we just want to have hegemony in terms of our military power relative to others. Um, this is from the, of course, I think Obama sort of south a little bit, you know, but, but certainly Bush, Trump, that's the idea. This is the report from China from the 90s called Unrestricted Warfare, where China essentially had a report where a couple of PLA generals said, given that we're behind economically in many ways, the only way we could really be uh, com competitive is to have unrestricted warfare. If anyone threatens us uh, to a certain degree or harms us, the war we have against others has to be necessarily unrestricted. And all, both of these types of narratives, I think, play into what Donald McKenzie has, you know, I, I know he's building lots of other people's work, like Cologne and others, in terms of performativity. He has a book called An Engine, Not a Camera, about the nature of financial theories. And the idea behind this book is that economist theories of markets essentially became the market. That their way of looking at the market, their way of theorizing it, so informed the way that traders and others dealt with the markets that it essentially became performative. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy. And my biggest worry is that these types of, this sort of self-reinforcing realist perspective 
is going to lead people to not believe that the forms of cooperation and trust necessary for regulation or abolition can ever work. Okay. Oops. So. Yeah. So let's get to the Schmidtian foundations of realism. Right. So the one idea could be that arms control here is a misguided extension or attempt to extend liberal constitutional principles to a global order. Right. That the friend-enemy distinction is paramount, exceptions can't be specified in advance, The part of sovereignty, the only, the really the core of sovereignty is the ability to declare the exception from something like a treaty, right? That you could be, you're not sovereign if you can't declare an exception from it. And I mean, this point of view has become more and more popular, I think, over time, if not acknowledged explicitly, at least implicitly. But the problem for the realist perspective, and here I want to say I, I'm not a realist, you know, I, I think that there are real problems with it, is that the arms race really helps no one, and it's a recipe of do for domination by the strongest. And part of the way we get out of the weaponized narrative of the arms race and the realism I've described is to tell other narratives that highlight the foolhardiness of the, the realist narrative, right? One of those narratives is by Robert H. Frank called Dharma economy. One of the things he talks about is the way in which uh, these uh, deers, the male deers grow larger and larger antlers to fight for mates. Okay? So within the fight between the deer, it is great to have a massive set of antlers, right? Because you can overwhelm your opponent, get some momentum, overwhelm your opponent, kill them off, humiliate them, and you can reproduce better than others. That's fitness in that you know, context. However, there's a natural limit to how big the antlers can be, right? I mean, at some point, you get stuck between trees, or you know, <laughs> you get to sort of leave the, leave the deer's head to sort of sag, uh, hurts the neck muscles, etc. Too many calories to put those things on. Um, and so this is a, and, and he has endless narratives of positional advantage. He talks about positional competition, positional goods, etc. So someone that was sort of exposed to the first realist narrative if they were in the animal kingdom would think, oh, I've got to have the biggest animal as possible in the battles, right? But once you're exposed to the narrative of positional competition, you might be able, more willing, more capable of recognizing the, fut the futility of the supposed part of realism, right? This also has been worked out in Richard Thaler's work, the Richard the Winner's Curse. Um, I'm not too partial to his later behavioral economics, the stuff that won the Nobel Prize, but you know, he's, he has some good, I think some of this earlier work where he describes some you know, experimental dynamics where he talks about people who are in a contest where they're bidding for a 10 pound note or a $10 bill in, in, in the US. And he is, there. The people who are bidding against each other and someone bids 990, 995, 999. Some people often will then bid like 1050 for a 10 pound note. And it just goes to these auction dynamics where people are just paying way too much for, uh, just in the spirit of competition, they lose track. So this, I think, is, you know, this is a way in which I think that it, you can counter the dangerous realism I discussed earlier with another realism, right? Maybe that's a way of getting at this. Here is from Thomas Schelling in his uh, classic book, Arms of Influence. He talked about how during the Eisenhower administration, the American defense budget was a self-imposed restraint. Um, uh, the administration was reluctant to embark on crash military programs. The idea was, we've got a budget, and there's a budget constraint here. And now we're going to ease into the political economy part of the talk. And this is where I find there's a fundamental disconnect in a lot of our discussion of global budget constraints and political economy. Because if you look at a lot of the elite policy discourse in the US, in Europe, among the OECD, others, there's huge enthusiasms for constraints on healthcare budgets. Everyone's sort of very concerned of are we going above 9, 10, 11, 12% of GDP on healthcare. You know? Certainly in the US, it's reached nearly panic levels. Um, in the 1980s, there were many economists who said if the US spent more than 8 or 9% of its uh, economy on healthcare, it would be doomed. Now the U.S. spends 18%, uh, and the doomsday predictions have doubled. You know, there's more and more people saying this. And so the question becomes, you know, do you have budgets, and are there ways in which the interaction of budgets might be another constraint, a realist constraint, on investment in arms buildups? 
This is uh, an example of, uh, this is from a comic book on the Affordable Care Act in America, and this is just an illustration of how this discourse continues. I'm sorry that the, it's not blown up enough. I, I've got to cut this down and be cut it. But the bottom line of the story is, this is a comic book by then Jonathan Gruber, who's one of the top economic advisors to the president about health care in 2009 to, uh, 2008 to 2010. And he said, in 1960, you know, we spent way more on the military than we did on health care. Okay, in the US. But in 2007, look at all these healthcare professionals who are pushing aside our military personnel. This is very worrisome to him, right? Okay. This is one reason why it's the Affordable Care Act and not the Quality Care Act. Not the Better Health Care for All Act. You know, it's, it's affordability. That's the concern because there's almost this, within the highest levels of power, councils of power, this idea within the US that, my God, if we spend too much on healthcare, we may not, may not be able to buy killer robots. Really keep up, and the irony there, of course, is the U.S. spends what seven times more than its nearest uh, than the nearest. Uh, uh, it spends enormous amounts more, excuse me, than, than, than per, at least per capita, and and then uh, and I'll get to a chart of the exact figures in a second, and it's just bizarre to see this, right? So let me get to my chart about the exact. Oh, and, and this also is just this is an unusual point, but it's just or it, this guy is not necessarily influencing the government, but it's amazing to see in Bruce Ackerman's book. Um, uh, social justice in the liberal state. He talks about how we're spending so much on health care potentially for the world's worst basket cases. You know, why are we spending so much money on, on say, this, the dice of course could be end of life care or um, the heavily disabled or others. Um, and he talks about, you know, there's this dialogue between Ackerman and Walls about the degree which you could spend money on health care. They're very concerned about this. Somehow the war is this exception that they don't think too much about in these types of uh, social justice contexts. Here's the, here's the chart, right? And, and you can see that there's enormous amount, I, I, what I meant was the US spends more than the next, I believe, seven combined. Not seven times as much, but the, the next seven combined, right? This is an enormous amount, and it's just so odd that the policy discourse is, is on that, is, 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 is concerned about that. And what's also very interesting is the US is, keeps, keeps pressuring all of uh, the allies, or one-time allies, I guess now, um, <laughs> to spend more, right? So it keeps wanting to see more and more military spending, in part because of the political economy of U.S. defense contracting, trying to create more markets abroad for U.S. Uh, private war firms. Right? So here are two narratives of this unequal global defense spending. And I think that what we have to think of is, and I think an older version of this, was that the reason the U.S. was spending so much was it was trying to keep the peace around the world. But the problem is that this really just does not seem plausible anymore. Like, I don't know how plausible it was like 10 years ago. It certainly seems, given the constitutional rot in the US right now, the fact that we just sort of have this uh, like a pretty uh, dysfunctional system where even the US deep state is very, very concerned about the people in charge of the, the person in charge of the executive branch and the people that are sort of his confidants. But it's hard to talk about that. And I think this concept of constitutional rot, I know I'm running out of time now, but I want to come back to it because it's, it really undermines that really your Pax Americana narrative. And so we've got to sort of think more deeply about this unequal spending thing. Part of the dimensions of the Pax Americana narrative were force projection in service of anti-terrorism and great, great power competition, right? that there would be, um, you could convince rivals that the US is committed to two when the US is actually engaged in one, when you convince rivals that the US is committed to no arms race, even when it's actually engaged in, in a robotics arms race, is that possible, I don't know. But also that there'd be an anti-terrorism rationale. But generally multi-party polarity might involve reduction in expenditure by the top spenders and increase in expenditures by the laggards, by others that are not spending so much. Maybe, I'm just putting this out there as a possible idea, and I, I guess maybe I'm going to come off as like a Trumpian myself and encouraging others to spend more, perhaps, if they don't believe that Pax Americana is it's a reasonable or rational narrative. So I think that this is a, a, a real difficulty, I think, in terms of thinking about the, the political economy, the level of expenditures, etc. One other thing to think about here is the odd contributors to um, genuine multipolarity and the market's ability to cheapen extraordinarily destructive technology. Um, there are libertarian thinkers in the US, like Eugene Volokh, who talk a lot about cheap speech, robotic speech. Volokh is very much in favor of robotic speech and giving robots the right to speak. But one of the things that we've learned is that 
What that cheap speech is, is often like bots on Twitter that can be used in weaponized purposes, etc. And the market's ability to cheapen extraordinary search technology goes down even to printable guns. There are now people in the US that are making um, uh, plans online so that if you have a 3D printer, it can 3D print a gun for you, right? And this is a problem where I think that the cost of using human services and the market's ability to cheapen this destructive technology is going to lead to a lot of problems with gender multipolarity. Why is that? Well, oops. I think, how much time do I have left, John? I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Uh, I think that the, the bottom line of it is that, I, I want to get back to the healthcare one. I, I, it's, it's a bit of a long argument with respect to the healthcare, but I think that the, the problem is that you've got a lot of countries that are spending, uh, that feel like they're spending too much in human services already, and that they don't have enough to spend on defense. So that sort of has become a big problem. And I think that, the, but I think that part of the, perhaps the, the political economy perspective there is that if you had maybe the greater powers, sort of great powers spending more money on their social services and less on defense, then this would lead to more peaceful possibilities in the future. I'm afraid it's uh, five minutes left, I'm just gonna uh, a little bit lower. This, the, the other point I was going to make is could lethal autonomous weapon systems be made more costly, right? If we live in a world where there's cheap drones, cheap 3D printable guns, potentially cheaper sort of weapons of mass destruction uh, uh, disseminated on the internet, can you make the, the, the process of creating weapon, even greater weapon systems more costly? I think you can by increasing liability for accidents. This is like, I know this is weak sauce, but uh, it's something. Taxation of defense contractors, reputational risk or cost, Socially responsible investing could divert some amount of money from investment in finding better and better ways to develop these uh, uh, autonomous weapon systems. But I think our, our current path is self-defeating. I think that our current path is that there are technocratic policymakers who are press pressing for self-liquidating automation of human services. And what I mean by that is they want to see cheaper and cheaper human services outside of the defense sphere. They want to see cheaper and cheaper health care, cheaper and cheaper other forms of human services. And where that surplus will be spent, it's hard to tell. And some of it, I think, will be spent and sort of consumed by arms race automation in the finance and military sectors. And I haven't even gone into finance, but I think there are many aspects of finance are essentially an arms race for more control of resources, more control of, uh, of money. And I think the same respect with military, the military sectors through arms race I've talked about. And my bottom line here is that it's time to complement an international, international law approach to the problem of laws with a political economy approach, which looks at how expensive is the technology that is being developed for these systems? Is it the case that every form of AI is dual use? Or are there ways of making AI that is used for destructive purposes more expensive? I've given a few examples there. Are there ways of ensuring that the defense of military and police and guard labor sector and society shrink as opposed to grow? That's another question I think that the political economy approach brings to this. And finally, the balance of power among powers. Do we believe in a narrative of great power competition, of multipolarity? Is that really where we're going? And in that case, do we need a more generalized distribution of abilities in this sector or not? One of the things I don't buy into is the possibility that the development of this technology levels the playing field. I gave a talk uh, a few months ago uh, uh, in a country that was a relatively small country, menaced by a larger country, and uh, the person at the talk, so one person said to me, you know, I really believe that we need to develop these autonomous weapon systems so we can defend ourselves against the oppressors or the people who are going to might take us over. And I, I was like, I really think if you look at the literature on the fusion of technology, very often technology is a force amplifier, not a force multiplier. And when you think about it from those perspectives, it's a very tricky problem to figure out how do you keep the amplification of force by entities that already have orders of magnitude more firepower and computational ability than smaller nations. How do you keep that force amplification from happening? I think perhaps one way is that you uh, encourage political movements in those great powers that divert money away from guard labor, defense, autonomous weapon systems. But there are other ways that you can restructure or at least influence the legal systems in them to change these things. The final point that I'll make, and I think 
I was inspired in parts of this talk by a book by Ilya Norbach called Robot Futures, where his bottom line is that really these futures are being determined now in many ways by people on the inside, in uh, AI departments, in, in doing machine learning, working in defense. And we've got to start opening this up to some forms of democratic debate and accountability, or at least public transparency, because um, I don't trust uh, that this is, I, I think that you could have very easily a type of strange love situation um, develop with these types of robots, the type of situation we've seen develop with nuclear weapons. And we've been very lucky to avert disaster with nuclear weapons. I don't think we'll be as lucky with autonomous weapon systems if they are developed to the extent that um, I worry they, they will be. So, thank you. Good. Um, I find it simply fascinating. I, sorry, I'm, uh, David, I'm a PhD student at the University of uh, Manchester International Law Center. Um, the, I was wondering if you could expand on the role of the private sector in some of this, because the, the reading that you give to the military still seems to be quite rooted in early 20th century ideas of warfare and sovereignty, and if the neoliberal turn has taught us anything, there's actually a large private sector that benefits off of this, or that is even developing this for non-military uses. I mean, Facebook uses the same facial recognition software, the same kind of trickle down from that that is being developed for military purposes. So how do you see just some of these things interacting, I guess? You, know, you gave a, a view of sort of state-down economics, but where does the private sector, or kind of transnational capital, maybe enter into these questions? Excellent, thank you, thank you. And I think that this is one of the, what, I'll start with um, the various autonomous weapons or weapons arms fairs that happen around the world. There are, uh, it's really striking when you look at the way in which military hardware is marketed and in many ways inspired by Hollywood movies, <laughs> or, you, or, you, or you have you know, these, these incredibly futuristic things that are sort of on market just being hawked at these conferences where thousands of people from defense departments, military departments around the world are visiting. And clearly they're in the same way that every field, I know all the attorneys in here, you're going to be hearing, I can promise constantly from managing partners and others that we've got to get technology, we've got to have a blockchain strategy, we've got to have an AI and law strategy, etc. And a lot of this stuff is vaporware, but it gets uh, it, there's enormous ex excitement about it, and it's an opportunity to make a ton of money, right? If you can sort of take this stuff. Ironically, perhaps the world's best hope is that um, if military systems, I mean, this is from a really cynical perspective, but if uh, military systems of the great powers in particular and lots of other countries are so hopelessly corrupted by graft that they buy things that are worthless and can't really, don't really have much destructive force. Maybe that's the answer. I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, certainly, that you, I, I just traveled, I was just by the um, uh, Edinburgh and I was shown one of the uh, ocean line or a, a military, uh, these large uh, uh, aircraft carriers that apparently is going to be made to be mothballed immediately after it's finished construction because it was cheaper to just continue the construction than to break the contract. This is up in Scotland. Um, I mean, the, the US F-35 is the trillion dollar plane that you know, no one wants, that the military doesn't really want, but a, a part of it is made in every congressional district in the US. Mm -hmm. So if you get rid of it, then every congressional district says you've got 200 blue collar jobs that will go away, and so we're going to keep building this thing. Certainly the amount of graft in China, I would not be surprised if it were uh, a similar or worse situation in China with respect to some of their hardware. Um, that could be a very bad bet. <laughs> and people like Peter Singer and August Cole in the book Ghost Fleet, they portray a China that is much, uh, that may have lots of um, uh, corruption in other fields, but does not have, has, has its act together with respect to this stuff. So I think that's one dimension of the issue. Another dimension is um, this new hashtag, hashtag tech will not build it, where you have the workers at Google uh, joining a letter saying that we will not build uh, Project Maven, which was I believe essentially a project that would allow the US would use Google technology to help the US help the US military develop a drone system that could use facial recognition to assassinate anybody. 
um, who's in the facial recognition register, and uh, almost everybody is, uh, or I think many, many, many people are. Uh, so I think that's the um, that's an interesting development. You've got folks at Amazon that are signing petitions, others are trying to. I'm a little worried about that, though. I don't really think that. Uh, I think when push comes to shove, um, the top people at Google, there's enough demand for these jobs that you're going to get uh, people are going to be fired or realize that they can't advance in the firm if they do this. I mean, I know of certain law firms that defend tobacco companies. Um, you can opt out of defending the tobacco company, but don't really think your chances of partnership are that great, right? And I think there's some could be a similar type of thing going on in these tech firms. So I think that ultimately the um, the the, <laughs> the the irony here is that yeah, you, you, or the, I mean, the, the most important thing to realize is that often a good political economy story is one of the tail wagging the dog. So the defense contractors and the private companies should be the narrative should be that. The military needs the best weapons and then contracts with these enemies in order to get the weapons. But of course, in, under Charles Lindblom's theories of circularity and other types of theories, you can say, no, it goes in the reverse direction. In fact, the people in the military, their deepest desire is to triple or quadruple their wages by becoming private contractors within the, the defense contractors. And therefore, the goal is to find, to do whatever is necessary to curry favor from the private company. What that involves is a uh, buying expensive hardware from them, and that's the way that's the way the system works. To the extent that is the case, that does suggest that you know the, the uh, we need to learn from books like Preventing Regulatory Capture, other books like that that talk about a strict separation between the uh, government and the private sector. So, to recap. I'm not into that original cynicism that I brought up. I don't think that we're going to be saved by horrific, incompetent uh, uh, machinery produced by an incompetent private sector. I do think, though, that looking at rules of contracting so as to insulate the people in the military from blandishments and inducements to buy unnecessary weapon systems or Asian arms races, that might be helpful. Might be. But um, it's, it's, it's a tough road to help. Oh, yes. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Yara, PhD law student in Kim. And you finished with the with, with the this uh, discrepancy between atomic weapons and uh, Laos by demonstrating that you think that atomic weapons uh, are war banned, but but uh, lethal autonomous robots cannot. And I, I would like to hear more about it in the sense that international uh, humanitarian law. And uh, of course, uh, uh, atomic weapons are not proportional. There is big collateral damage. There is no distinction between civilians and, and militants. Uh, so, so it's very close to, to the regulation of warfare uh, since the Geneva Conventions. While while lethal autonomous robots, they are so precise and so surgical. It's like the ultimate uh, dream weapon according to classic uh, international humanitarian law analysis. And, and my question is maybe because of this problem, we can draw inspiration from. Uh, different things that are alternative mechanisms to international law to regulate or to restrict the use of drones, like uh, decolonized, uh, I don't know, decolonization uh, methodologies, or methodologies, or to draw the process to international law. Uh, because if you look at the Security Council, which is maybe the only current body in international law that can actually make a, a resolution that uh, that will prevent uh, a certain country of using lethal. The, the, the Security Council has five, five permanent members that are more, most likely to do, to be the first uh, five countries that will use uh, lethal autonomous weapons against sort of uh, countries that are not a part of the decision making process in the UN. So, right. so I wonder what you think about these uh, these issues. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really difficult question. I mean, so I, I think your question leads in a number of different directions, right? Because I mean, I think the point about the Security Council is would lead to deep skepticism about the nature of international institutions as they stand now, right? The the point about the autonomous weapon system versus the nuclear bomb, I think, is a really interesting one because I think that on the one hand, you're right to say that. This seems like a dream weapon, right? That this is the way in which we could finally make sure that um, a force was applied in a proportional and fair-minded way, right? Or in, in a way that almost is like law enforcement. I mean, my first response to that would be that you really need something like law enforcement to make that legitimate. You know, like I, mean, I think that you, you, you have 
least in the US, you have some examples of I think police officers engaging in summary executions of individuals and not really being held accountable for that. And so I think we could see something similar to that happening with these autonomous systems. I think that the question of the alternative is always very important. Like, what's the alternative to the autonomous weapon system, right? That's a very important question. Is like, and, and, and I think also the final uh, response, I guess, I would give to that particular um, uh, contrasting drive is that it seems like it is the terror of the nuclear weapon, it's, it's horrificness that keeps it from being dropped, right? Um, and whereas the very small scale nudge or small scale effort to take to, to influence people means that you used it more and more. And here's where, I mean, in, in my book, what I'm trying to, what I'm working out with, working up with, is I start thinking about the application of force by states with the Chinese social credit scoring system. And to explain the system, because I think this is really helpful in contextualizing um, the appeal and the terror of these types of, of calibrated weapon systems. The Chinese social credit system say, if you, so let's say that you were, um, uh, you didn't visit your parents one week, and actually the filial piety is scored in the system. So you could be penalized for that, but it wouldn't be like you could go to jail or something, and you'd have a fine of, of, of uh, uh, money you find against you, you just might lose a couple points on your system. Okay? Let's say that you don't show up to your doctor appointment. You might lose a few points. Let's say that you uh, uh, go on label and uh, make a critical comment about the regime. You lose a couple points. Right? Um, there's all the, but then maybe you could earn it back later. You know, later you give your, your seat on the bus to a elderly person. Maybe you get a point for that. You know? um, maybe you, uh, you, you go to a party meeting or something. You get another couple points for that. What's so interesting about this system, I think, is that on the one hand, you could say this is the perfection of the state's tutelary, um, uh, paternalistic, enriching, nurturing relationship to its subjects, right? You could say the state's not, like, your choice. It's your choice. You know, we're not telling you you can't, like, jump the turnstile to jump on the train. But you're going to lose a certain number of points. You've chosen to lose those points. Now, we're not telling you that you are not supposed to, we're not putting you in jail for criticizing the, for Xi Jinping. But if you do, or you retweet someone who does, you lose a certain number of points, right? And this is a system where I feel like, on the one hand, if the alternative to that system were instant jailing for anyone who did any of those things, sure, the point system sounds a lot better, right? But if we're looking at the grand scheme of things about erecting structures of technology that enable a level of granular control of human individuals that has never been possible before, it's terrifying, right? It's very similar debates now in the US over immigrant detention and uh, ankle bracelets or cell phone monitors. The idea is that detention centers are horrific. The social justice argument is that you just put uh, ankle bracelets on everyone. Similar with lots of, we have a huge incarceration problem. One percent of Americans are incarcerated, right? And it's just this, this one third of a percent. It's this huge number. Over a million people are incarcerated in often horrific conditions. The liberal technocratic answer to that would be give, put an ankle bracelet on them, and then you can add stuff to the ankle bracelet, right? If they fail to go to work on a given day, make it a little tighter. If they fail to uh, report to the probation officer, maybe it gives a buzz. Right? You can tell people you can opt into this, right? You can opt into that or you can go to jail, right? All of these things, I think, are, we need to deeply reflect upon them as structures of power before we incrementally choose them. And I think that's been the great privilege of writing a book on this over the course of like five years, you know, being able to think about this for like five years or so, because it gives you, that when you're in the activist community, I think, or a lot of times when you're in sort of a particular situation of being a decision maker, you kind of have to choose, like there's just a very narrow range of options. But one of the things I hope that the academy can do is bring to this perspective that says, yes, the autonomous systems and the robotic systems may seem better than what we have, but we've got to be incredibly cognizant of how we're constructing them, lest we create structures of control that are so granular that they become a really deep form of oppression. So that's, that's just my thought.
Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, Hi. Danny Reader. Um, my question kind of goes off of this question because I was curious about this um, need for automation to sort of account for human bias, the way you were talking about the credit system, and particularly the project that you are working with for the Chinese credit system. Um, so my question was more related to the utility of the system in the scheme of how does this account for human bias, or if you think that this is actually something that it helps to achieve if you're using a system that determines whether you're good or bad, as opposed to um, you know, one person, but at the same time, there is a system of people who've decided that this is the criteria that we assess people. So the question, I think you've already addressed it in, in some sense, um, particularly the scale of this and what's the grand scheme of what it can do. So I guess my question now is, from your point of view, um, what, what do you think about this system? It's dangerous, it has some utility, but for your own personal perspective, where do you stand on this? Right. I mean, I think that with respect to the bias, um, I, I mean, I think it's very easy to encode certain very troubling biases in these systems that you know, are going to Associate. I mean, with respect to the Chinese system, many times like any effort at political or religious identity outside of the party can be seen as marking one as um, a threat. And particularly, like in uh, Xinjiang uh, province, it's, I, I, my Chinese pronunciation is horrible. But it's X I N J I N G G. Usually transliterated. Um, they are have created. The Economist has, has written. Even the Economist writes like deeply troubling articles where they are, they're calling them out, uh, the Chinese government, for assuming certain things about families um, and leading that to government monitors and intent surveillance. So if, for example, they visit a home and if someone has a beard, they get a government minder for a, a year, okay? Whether that person or they, who has to sort of be with them, uh, play with the children, watch what's going on in the family, etc. Clearly, that can be more easily achieved by surveillance, right? You just put up a, a, a video camera in the home or something like that, right? Um, I don't know, that, that perhaps they're kept from international, by international scorn from doing something like that. And I think that these forms of bias um, could easily filter into other forms of systems developed by the United States in terms of um, act actions that are done by US allies not being seen as discrediting, but access being done by non-allies, whatever they happen to be this month, um, are seen as discrediting, and that being very problematic. And I think that ultimately, where I stand on this stuff is, I want to see less investment in this technology, because I feel like it is a slippery slope down to a road of microcontrol. So that's sort of my concern. Um, but I also realize that it's, uh, I, I, I want to see, uh, but that, that's where I'll stop there, in terms of like the, the political kind of the tech, but I think there's, there's more to be said though, I think about the global balance of powers that, that we can maybe talk about the, at the uh, crowbar. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Is, is it, is it, oh, yeah, um, yeah, my name is Harry, I'm from, I'm a visitor from the Math Institute. Uh -huh. um, what I missed a bit or was, are you worried how this technology affects the people who actually make the decisions at all? <laughs> so it seems that the warfare becomes more and more abstract. There's kind of no skill in the game for the people who are actually involved. Let's say, you know, a thousand years ago, a, ge a general would have to go to, you know, to war with his soldiers, so he would make other decisions. Maybe be more considerate or whatever. So are you, are, are you worried about this at all? Or have you thought about this? I'm very worried about it. Yeah. I mean, and it's funny because there's, there's, there's a couple of levels on which I'm worried. One is, in, in the US, there's been this growing literature on the trauma, the PTSD, of the drone operators at Creech Air Force Base. But essentially, they, just, they have breakfast with their family, they drive on out, and then they are uh, just in a virtual reality goggles or with goggles with night vision and just killing people. You know, once they're told that a certain level of uh, suspicion has been raised about uh, someone who's on there. I mean, there are terms that, uh, that Shaman Yu talks about. He says that sometimes the people are referred to as bug splats, right? Which is an echo of the really offensive um, uh, 
Worse than Scott Card novel, novel uh, Ender's Game. You know, and again, you can't underestimate how much uh, science fiction affects the imaginaries that people are developing and stuff. And you know, that's happens. But I think your broader point is, you know, yeah, if there's no risk, why not? Right? If there's no risk from uh, our from, of your own troops being killed in an operation, why not go whole hog? And I mean, I see that actually evolving again in um, you know various scenarios that you have a huge uh, that, that is going to lead to more and more deployment of these types of uh, interventions. And that's what Boeing worries about. That's what the other theorists worry about. That you just have no when it's totally asymmetrical. Yeah. Why not use it? So I, I and I don't know how that's overcome. I don't really know how you over how you I mean, over that. Yeah. Do you think maybe cultural shift would that would, would help that people would demand from the you know that it would be sort of that we would view this attacks in a different light that we would demand as a society our military leaders to be more involved. Say if we if we learn that the new commander in chief or well, that's a bad example, but say a new general <coughs> has never actually been on the battlefield. Yeah. That there would be a public out outcry about that, because I don't think that's happening right now. People are not really you know, worried about this point. There was a controversy over the award of medals to drone operators. Oh, right. And I think that they, I think ultimately they decided not to award medals, because the idea was that it doesn't seem like, that, that if you're not in personal danger, you don't get it, right? So that would be one, that's one very small way in which that is done. But it, it, it involves, I mean, a lot of it also involves, can you create some form of compassionate response by the entity that's doing the bombing and has the military power, right? And wow, that is difficult. I mean, it's really, really difficult. And that's another reason why I'm skeptical about and really worried about the development of technology in this area, is because I feel like the it seems like there are vast political rewards going to politicians now who are willing to dehumanize an other, right? I mean, we see it with Salvini in Italy, Orban in Poland, you know, all over the world. There are these sort of movements that are essentially, I, mean, I see it in the United States very clearly, use of the word infestation, use of other terms, you know, to sort of analogize um, quote, quote, others. And that's even within the country. You know, that's not even, and that's not even counting the use of the rhetoric for those outside of the country. So I think that that is an area where um, uh, there has to be a political common movement. Um, so, yeah. I'm sorry, it seems skeptical, but you know, I, I, that's what we're, I don't think there's any other way out of this sort of uh, um, dynamic, because clearly, I, I, because of my theory about the technology as a force amplifier, not, not, a, not an equalizer, I, uh, uh, I mean, as an equal, I don't think that it's, uh, I don't think we're going to get to a point in, 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 where um, there will be that many consequences for the great powers that are being. I could be wrong. Yeah, so, sorry. Yeah. Um, just wanted to uh, ask you what you think about um, the scientific community. Uh, because it's them who develop the technology, after all. Yes. Um, funded by whoever, state, private sector, it doesn't matter, but they will have to develop it. Yeah. or they will choose to develop it. So, could they not self-regulate? Because we've seen this happening to some extent at least, or maybe to a great extent in biotechnology, mm -hmm. DNA and cloning, humans, so probably it's not really happening as much as we could, or it's not happening. So that was probably an achievement of the scientific community itself, which must be quite small comparatively to... Uh, it's, it's the good. Yeah, like like the Google thing. Yeah, yeah I yeah, do think that like that, that, that is a hopeful vision. I mean, I was just at a conference on artificial intelligence and the future regulation of AI, and there were there was a paper on Asilomar, which was the genetic engineering conference that was held, I think, in 1978 or 80, where the people that were part of genetic engineering agreed there were certain things they would not do. You know, and they 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 they, they, they and, and the question of the norms, how those norms operate. And how you censure someone that violates them is a very difficult one. You know, but I think you're right to say that every effort that can be encouraged among the scientific community to develop certain lines they will not cross is to be applauded. And whenever there are these letters to Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Microsoft Azure was recently used uh, in the uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement detentions in the US where they're, they're separating children from their families. 
you know, and people said, no, we, we should not be part of that at all. Anytime that that occurs, I, I sign on and I, I encourage others to, and I, I want to see that happen because I do think that there is a certain level of, uh, that may be the last, uh, uh, that, that may be what, what we can start with and then build on that toward things that are more durable um, in the future. So. Hey, Frank, thank you so much, and oh, we'll welcome. keep it going <laughs> afterwards. Yeah? yeah. Thanks again, Frank.